for creation. That's from, this is not scripture, no. This is from the Talmud. They were there, all right? They were there. I can't tell you this is a fact. But this is from the Talmud, uh, from Rosh Hashanah 27a. Some, some say, this is a debate actually in the Talmud, just so you know, this is the overriding uh, understanding of the Talmud. But there are also some that say that creation was in, in Tishrei, which is the month right after Elul. Okay, just so you know, that it is controversial, a little bit. Okay? The 25th of Elul will be Sunday night slash Monday, because the Hebrew day starts when? At night. At night, right, it goes evening to evening. So this year, it will be this Sunday night and Monday. Now, I'm telling you this ahead of time, along with the study, because traditionally, from Esrim, from Yishad and Elul, up until Rosh Hashanah, there are traditional readings each night until Rosh Hashanah. Anyone want to guess what they might be? Genesis chapter 1. Each day, so the first day, Sunday night and Monday, you will be reading the account in Boreshit, in Genesis, for day 1. The next day, day 2. The next day, day 3. You with me? Until day, Rosh Hashanah will be day 6, when man was created. And the creation was complete. Everybody with me? Okay. So, uh, if you wanted to do that, embrace that as, as uh, part of your roots, the roots of your faith, then you know, now you have a more insight and you'll be able to do that. Now the next one I put, new age. <laughs> so there's another, a third understanding of this being a new year at Rosh Hashanah. See, you would think of the 25th of the Lua being a new, uh, the new year for all of creation, because all time, space, and matter that we talked about, that we when we did a study on Bereshit 1 1, we had been created on the first day, right? But mankind, it would be a new year for mankind on Rosh Hashanah, because that's when man was created. So it marks our year, you know what I mean? Now, like I said, those are, tra those are traditional understandings, right? So maybe you embrace them, maybe you don't. Maybe you say, well, those guys, they didn't know. How could they just. Is it worth commemorating creation? Yeah, it is. God says that's why we worship on Shabbat. Right? So it's already being commemorated every single week. But, you know, this is a little addition to that. However, Yom Teruah, Yom Teruah is coming up. That's the biblical name for the festival on the same day as Rosh Hashanah, right? What does Yom Teruah signify prophetically? Feast of Trumpets. What does it signify prophetically? Return of Mashiach. Return of Mashiach! With all the trumpets going, and then you have the last trump, and then and what does the Greek Kadashah say about the last trump, right? The last trump, I don't know. Okay. Maybe turn that a little bit. As long as they can still hear, uh, get a good Okay, so it talks about a last trump. He returns, and the dead are resurrected, right? At the last trump. Now, that's not talking about, you know, uh, uh, descent of the Donald Trump after he becomes president or something. That's not what we're talking about. You know, there'll be three Trump presidents or something. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the last blowing of the show of The long, the tequila, the long, the long last at the end, right? That's what we're talking about, the last Trump. And it was signal, so it symbolizes, it signifies the return of the issue. So let me ask you a question. Does that not put us into a new era? A new era. Every time a king, we were reading through uh, Chronicles, yeah? Yes. And every time there's a new king, you start reading the accounts after the king comes into power. The fourth year of this king, this happened, right? The fifth year of the king, the ninth year of this king, so and so invaded. Time. Time is structured around the reign of that king. It's as if time is in some ways 
you know, began again. It was a new era when the king took the throne. How, how much more from the, the Messiah than earthly kings? It will be a new era. It will be. Whether you think it's the new year or end of the year or not, it symbolizes a new era with a new year when the Mashiach returns. Is everybody good with that? Yeah. I think that's pretty motivating myself. I think that's, that's very, very meaningful to me. Another thing for you to grasp if you don't know, the, the way to greet each other, although so next Shabbat will actually be Rosh Hashanah, we'll be here together, but it starts the night before. We'll be having live stream, uh, a short live stream service. Uh, and one of the things you can you can say uh, to each other, type into each other, right? Until the next day when you can say it to each other. Shana Tova. Everyone say Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Yeah, what is Shana Tova? What is Shana? Yeah. 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 And tova good. is good. Yes, the feminine singular for good, right? And so year shana is feminine, and tova is feminine, matches. Mercy. So that's the. And another way to say is lashana tova, lashana tova. Say this, lashana tova. This is more uh, another way to do it is to say to a good year, to a good year, right? You're wishing, hoping, and fervently trying to bless the person that they will have a good year. You hear me? Okay, so you know the meaning now. You're prepared. You're prepared. A little more for. Uh oh. That's my fault. Alright, a little bit more. Uh, again, I said it would be on Friday evening, it would be in live streams. Uh, on YouTube and on uh, uh, Facebook because we probably are not going to have uh, PowerPoint, so we'll be able to use the two cameras and they'll hook it along nicely, I hope. Um, but what we'll be doing, part of what we'll be doing then, you might want to prepare for at home. The traditional foods to bring in the new year are apples with honey. Right? And the round column, you can go to uh, uh, the Publix on San Jose, or there's a Win Dixie a little bit south on San Jose, just south of 295, and they'll have them. You can call your local market, they might have them say, Do you happen to have a round column with raisins? Right? It's a different, it's not the normal column, right? Because it's Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. You, you might want to call ahead and order it yeah. to make sure that you get one. Right, exactly, because they're, they're only for this time of year, and they're going to get snapped up. If there's, a, if there's a Jewish community in the area, they're going to be grabbing them, right? So you want to call ahead, try to um, try to get one for yourself. Then when you do it online, you know, you can be doing it at home, right, along with us. If you slice the, you can slice the apples up, so you get like a slice of apple and dip it in the honey. Take a piece of pala, dip it in the honey. Well, you can give them a squeeze honey. Maybe it's easier to squeeze the honey on top, right? Maybe it's a little less messy. Well, depending on who is doing the squeezing, it might be a little less messy. Okay. Is everybody good with that? Okay. Now, this is a great time. We've been going through Bereshi. We've been going through Genesis, right? But, you know, on and off. We had to stop for a little while. But we did the first two verses very in depth, right? Yes. You remember? I hope you remember. Mm -hmm. All right, if you, if you don't remember, the videos are up there. You can look them up on Facebook and refresh yourself. But the essence, the first two verses that we did, we learned that in the beginning, the cut, even though it doesn't say, it doesn't have the definite article. No, it was really the beginning because nothing else existed before that. There were no stars. There were no there was no earth, no, no living beings, right? So contextually, it was the beginning. Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And it's something. It was a Allah creation that only that only God could do. The word that we both use for creation there is something only God could do. He created the time, space, and matter. 
It was the very beginning, thus time. The heavens, which is space, and the earth stopped. It wasn't the planet, it was the earth stopped. All the, the molecules on your, uh, what is it, the periodic table, all the matter. Okay? So time, space, and matter came to be. And they came forth from nothing. This bala creation, this word you believe bala, is creating from nothing. This is why only Elohim can do it. Everybody with me? The second verse, we, we remember uh, studying, and the earth, this matter, was unformed and void. See, it's not the flow of it's all unformed and void. Void and empty. There's nothing in it. There's no living beings or something there. It's empty, it's void. Empty. And darkness was about the faces or surfaces of the abyss, okay, which is sometimes translated as deep, an abyss. You have all of space and there's a bunch of matter that's unformed there. You with me? Okay. And the ruach. Everyone who can tell me ruach? Spirit. Yeah, the spirit, wind, or breath. But in this case, it's ruach Elohim. So it's the spirit, capital S, of Elohim. It's the spirit of God. Contextually here, we know which type of ruach we're dealing with. Right? And the ruach of Elohim. Some of your Bibles have different words here, but the word in Hebrew isn't talking about just hovering like, blah, right? No, hovering tremulously. You could say he was vibrating. He was so with ex you already want to think maybe with excitement because he knows what's going to happen, what he's going to do, right? There's anticipation there. He's vibrating tremul tremulously over the surfaces of the waters. Right? The word there, yes, it is plural in the Hebrew, faces, okay? and so is waters. Waters is always plural in Hebrew, just like heavens is always plural. That's where we've gotten to so far. Now we have verse 3. Was anyone still taking notes? Let me back up a little bit. Give you a minute. Raise your hand if you still need this, and I'll keep it up there for you. Everybody good? Okay, no hands. So, all right, we'll move on to what we're dealing with today. Break sheep or Genesis chapter one, verse three. It's a short one. See, not too bad. We're the Hebrew. You can say after me. Bayonia. Bayonia. Elohim. Elohim. Yehi. Yehi. Or. Or. Bayhi. Bayhi. Or. Or. Amen. You just read a verse in Hebrew. Amen. Congratulations. So the first word, Bayonair, it starts with, some of this you might not get, and that's okay, don't stress about it. It starts with a wow. In ancient Paleo Hebrew, the first letter would be called a wow. In modern, more biblical Hebrew from like about 1000 BC until through now, it's called a wow. Used to be a W sound, now it's a V sound. Uh, it's, there's no problem with that, by the way. Sure, of the earth, he was speaking biblical Hebrew, which was the loud sound. Everybody with me? There's no problem. He didn't condemn anybody for not making a W sound or anything. Hear me? All right, make that very clear. Okay, and uh, it's about con conjunctive, it meaning and, and for this case, more, more accurately, then. Then, Amar is connected to Amar. And it's an imperfect form, that's where the yoke comes from, it's a verb. So uh, normally imperfect would say, what, Keith? Imperfect, he. usually would say, he will say. Yeah, usually it would be in the future. Yep. Um, but the valve in front of it switches that around so that it's past tense again. Right. And it's a third person, masculine, this is very important, see, I have my masculine, first of all. So, because there's some people out there say, you know, God was a woman, right? Okay. Uh -huh. Sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, it's also in the singular. Now, God is not a human being. Everyone, if you don't believe me, raise your hand. God is not a human being. Do we have any problems with anybody saying, saying that? Okay. <laughs> there's a couple people trying to make us in the back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, God is not a human being, so God is not a man or a woman. 
but the pronouns that I normally have chosen and the verbal structure normally chosen to go along with the names for God, there's you know some exception, are generally masculine. All right. So uh, to say that God is a man or a woman is not accurate. You know, most commonly we see like father, right? But there are some words that go the other way. What we're really dealing with is attributes of God. Just like you have attributes, you have we all have the same range of attributes, but within each one we have different sliding scales, right? And in different cultures, some of those things are different. Like uh, men more athletic or something, or in certain ways, maybe more powerful or or head of the family, which is really why God is usually in masculine pronouns because he's the head of everything, right? It's not that there's a male God and a female God, like much of the cultures around Israel, though. Don't get that in your head, because it's wrong. It's not that the Father is a man, and the Spirit's a woman, and the Son. You see what I'm saying? Don't get that. It's not correct. It's out there. That's why I have to say it. It's actually floating out there, and it's wrong. Okay, so masculine and singular. You'll learn that it's important that it's singular in a couple minutes here. And the meaning is say. The meaning is say, not sing. Some people say he sang creation into being, but the word here is not sing, which we don't have a Hebrew word for. The Hebrew word here is for say. See, if you, if you, have, if you want to see a little more confirmation of that, check out Psalm, or from the thing you mean, Psalm 33, verse 9, where it talks about how he spoke creation into existence, not saying it into existence. You see, multiple sources, and you won't, and you won't find a verse that says he's saying it into It may be something that some people traditionally believe, but that doesn't make it right. You with me? Mm-hmm. Hey, Jane, you can start now, everybody. <laughs> 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 so, uh, then we have uh, this, this combo of vinyl mayor shows with the vowel and the amir shows the past tense. And if there was no subject there, it would be and he said. You with me? It would be and he said or it said. But we don't know too many it's we refer to animals as it is sometimes, right? But and it said. If there were no subject. But the Hebrew sentence order is different than English. In English we would say and he said. But in, in, in Hebrew, you would say, and said he. In Hebrew, in English, we would say, I threw the ball. In Hebrew, you would say, what, Kathy? <laughs> threw he the ball. Mm-hmm. You have to rearrange it. Mm-hmm. So, that's the norm. But sometimes the words are out of order. And you have right, loose, right? Sometimes you have to rearrange the words when you're doing interpretation from Hebrew to English. It can feel a little tricky, right? Because you're not used to it. But occasionally in Hebrew, they're out of order. They kind of match the English. And there's a reason for that. When it happens, you're showing emphasis for whatever's being thrown to the front. Okay? And that's not happening here. Here we have this verb, and he said, and we had, and we said. Elohim said, and Elohim said. That's our subject, Elohim. This is who's doing the speaking. Now, here's something else in Hebrew. In Hebrew, the verb has to match its noun and number. It's plural. Okay? And Elohim, though, is plural. And remember this slide? My number is. Singular. Singular. Elohim is being used as a unit plural in a unit plural sense. Again, we saw it in verse 1, right? Again, we're seeing this plural name for God. And we know it's only God. There's no angels there because only Elohim, only God can borrow create from nothing. 
So people say, is that a legitimate point or something? No. No. Elohim is being used in a unit plural sense. Everybody with me? Did I lose anybody? Alright. Yehi. This is an interesting word. So it comes from the Hayah. It's a pair of imperfect third person masculine singer again. Here, you know, they understand all of it. One of the things that's important is it's just it. That means it's a command. Mm-hmm. It's a command. This isn't like commentary or something or some passive. It's not this going to happen. No. He's, going, he's commanding this to happen. This is a command for be, or take place, or happen, or become. That's what the command is. You with me? In Gematria, this word, the nut, and I'm not into Gematria. You know, sometimes it's interesting though. I'm just telling you, right? Some people go too far. But I'm just letting you know. In Gematria, though, this word has a number. You know, every Jewish letter, every Hebrew letter has a numeric equivalent. This is how in Revelation we've been reading, right? There's a certain person we all know, right? Who's going to appear with the number of his name is something, 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 right? You heard this? <laughs> yes, really? Okay. So, this is how you get that. So every letter has a numeric equivalent. But this word has a numeric equivalent, and guess what? It's 25. This is the first command by God on day one, right? The first vocalization, the first command on day one, and the word that this command is doing this, this command word, B, equals 25. Kind of a connection maybe with the, the little 25. It's a bit of a stretch, right? But it's, but it's an interesting connection. It's an interesting connection, I think, right? Maybe it adds a little way. Be what though? What is he commanding to be? What is he commanding to take place, to happen? What is it? Whatever. So we need more. Oh. It means nothing like our English word. This word, I could mean, I mean several different words now. You see, all these, these words or phrases are all in parentheses, or all in uh, quotes, because they're all different meanings from different lexicons for the same word here. So you get a sense of what it means, because you know, it's hard to translate exactly what something means sometimes from one language to another. It can mean light, light of day, daybreak, become a light, shine, real light, become light. You with me? You're getting a sense of what he's commanding here. Okay? So let, in English we would say, let there be light, or be light. But we usually, we had, a, we had an English word there, let, right? So I want you to understand, so when we say, in English we say, let there be light, so it's not like, okay, I guess you can let there be light. You know what I mean? It's not a passive thing. It's not, okay, allow light to happen. No, he's commanding light to come into existence. Right? In case you were confused, it says, let there be light. Sounds a little passive. It's not. It's not. It's true. Okay, so now let's let's dig into one of the questions we probably all had at one point or another, unless you're a new believer, right? Um, what did he not say here? He's saying, let there be light. What does he not say? What's the question you usually have when you look at the creation of how people look at day one? Let them be light, and then they keep reading, and they get to day four, and something starts to confuse that. Any, any ideas what that might be? The creation of the sun and the moon. Creation of the sun and the moon and the stars is like day four. Yeah. Right? How could that be? Right? How could that be? And skeptics of the Bible will say, see, that's good, it's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. See? Right? Okay. Uh, yeah. So how is that possible? Well, if you talk to this scientist, uh, Henry M. Morris, and many others, you know, and it doesn't, it does not take a scientist, by the way, to figure this out. 
but I'm just letting it down. This particular statement, light is far more fundamental than light givers or light bearers. In the ancient world, the stars and the sun were considered, and the moon itself, even though it's a reflect, a, a bearer of reflective light, they're all bearers of light. They are not light itself. What is it actually? What is light itself? Yeah, light in this room. Do we have the sun in this room? No. No. There's a bearer of light. It's the bulb up there, right? Can you have a, a light without a bearer? Right? You have a chemical reaction produces light. And remember what we just had? We had a big blob of stuff, all the elements, and we had hovering tremulously over it, the spirit who then breathes out, right, words, again, this, that mixes these things together in a very specific way because he's commanding there to be light, and it happens. Are you with me? There's a little rash that says this was a different kind of light. That's right. That's different. This was a different kind of light. Okay? It says the Midrash. I'm investigating writing the Midrash. It says it was a different kind of light. And it's, it's a different kind of light that we that in the days of Noah, when everyone was so evil, it said that God withdrew this original light. And he's keeping it for the for the righteous who will enter the Allah Haba. The age to come. Right? This is what they said. Just giving you the insight in the traditional world, in the Jewish world, right? Okay? Mm -hmm. A little understanding. It might come up later. <laughs> now, in the AME, the ancient Near East, okay? I think I mentioned it already ahead of time. They looked at the celestial beings that you see shining up there, and they called them, they didn't, they didn't attach them as being like themselves. They all saw them, not just the, the Hebrews, but all the people in the Near East, or most of them, there were different cultures, different groups, and all of them had this same, this commonality of understanding that, for instance, the sun itself is not a light, it's a bearer of light. Okay? You see, you have that perspective. So it's a, these, these bodies, these celestial bodies, that where these chemical reactions are continually taking place on them. Does this make sense? Isn't that what they really are? Okay. And the, the ending here, by he or, say by he, or. And there was light. Or, and it happened. Light. Or, and there came to be light. Some of you have been through some Hebrew classes, and you know that there are word choices when you make translations, right? Yeah. So the different ways to put this. I think the simplest is to go with the first one, but uh, there can be some variation in how you do it. And maybe that very, the understanding of seeing the variations might help you understand what's happening a little better, right? And you see the different options. So I thought I'd put them there for you. And I want you, though, to focus on those words for a moment. And I want you to really grasp the power of God in a universe of nothing but darkness. Maybe your world is pretty dark right now for one reason or another. In a universe that's nothing but darkness, all it took for God to speak. We had light. He spoke. And it came to be. He commanded. And it stood firm. None of us have the 
power to override that. None of us can wipe out the light. Might be a certain angel, or some group of angels who might want to, mm. but even they can't. You understand? Mm -hmm. God's light is eternal. So where is she in Genesis 1, 3? And Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light. And that was the first record of God speaking. That's significant, right? What's happening here? Energy. Verse 1, we had time, space, and matter. Now we have energy. God speaks. And the result is light. He energized. These are, these are the words of that scientist, Henry M. Morris, and his organization as well. He energized. God energized the vast cosmos through the marvelous electromagnetic force system which maintains all structures and processes in matter. How this universe is held together, things rotating and evolving, the way that they move, gravity, these things, how did they all come to be from a big mass, of, a big abyss of nothingness, of, of just, here's how, God spoke, God spoke, and you know what the big kind of shot says that you shoot up, holds all things together. Mm -hmm. You see proof of this in our DNA too, but that's a different story, by the way. If you're interested in that, see me after the message. Twelve, Yeshua, and you. How did, how did that all come to play in this? Twelve, Yeshua, and you. John 3, verses 19 to 21 says, the light has come into the world. What's he talking about in that context? The light has come into the world, but people prefer darkness. They hid from the light. The people who were evil hid from the light. Because they didn't want their deeds to be revealed. People who are righteous, it says, run to the light. They're drawn to the light. Who is the light in John 3? It's figurative language. Anyone? Yeshua. Yeshua. It's too simple, right? I couldn't get any hands up because it's just too easy. <laughs> Proverbs tells us something else about light. The mitzvah. What's mitzvah? Commandment. Commandment. And it says the mitzvah. Like all the Torah's one mitzvah. It is a lamp. Torah is light. It's God's ways. He is light, and His ways are light. And there are proofs that discipline are the way to life. What is it? What is our faith called in the Book of Acts? We follow the way. And this is from Proverbs 6.23. And in 2 Corinthians, Shaul, who always had something to say about everything, right? So we got to get him in there too. He said, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shine in our hearts. Yeshua said, when he was in the world, I am the light of the world. When he was getting ready to leave, he said, you are the light of the world. Just like the moon is a reflector of the light of the sun, we, there's two things. We reflect his light, but also he, he lives inside of us. He can shine right through us, right? Not just reflecting on the surface, but he's shining right through us. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, you're used to an hour and a half at the very least. But this is Hasot. 
Everyone say Hasot. Hasot. Maybe we can tell me what Hasot means. <laughs> Hasot is the end. The end. We're ending is the end. A couple of reasons. One, we have an immersion today. How special. Two, and we two. I think so far. Maybe who knows what will happen. At least two now. Okay? Uh, and uh, both, both of these two is the first time, like, coming to God, right? The first time. Awesome. Uh, that's a sort of immersion. Okay, so there are different immersions for different things, right? Uh, so there's two immersions, and we have to go to, the, we're going to a different place to do that. So uh, if you want to join us, we'll give you the details after. It's actually uh, where I live. We have a big pool there, so we'll be able to sneak in there. Get our immersions, have a little ceremony, and, and then maybe we can go eat together afterwards to celebrate as long as the sun is down. Well, that's good. <laughs> have to make sure the sun is down. All right. Another thing is, I want to remind you again before we leave out of here, uh, and I'm trying to do this for each holiday as they're coming up beforehand, right? Is we will have a Friday night live stream so that we can celebrate the coming in of the New Year together and not have to wait till the next day, right? How many of you wait? Did, how many of you bother with January 1st? I don't know. Some people do, some people don't, right? Sometimes we try to stay up, but we usually fall asleep. Just, just to see the fireworks, because Kevin loves fireworks, really. Not like we, you know, the whole Janice thing, two minute, go with God, whatever. Not into that. We do like fireworks. <laughs> Looks like we're the only ones who like fireworks. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so we're going to have that live stream so we can bring the year in together. Right? It's not more fun to do stuff together like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the night of prayer, I have here the night of prayer at 6 p.m. is canceled. It's not really that it's canceled. It's just we're not going to be here. It will still be going on if you prefer to stay here and do that. Or, actually, it won't be here. They're not coming in either. They're going to do just Zoom because we're not here, but they will be doing it. If you go to the to their site, Church of the Redeemer, there is a link. So wherever we are, or wherever you are, you can sign in and join the night of prayer still anyway via the link. So if you're watching, so you, you know you wanted to join the night of prayer, you should pray for our city, pray for our nation, with everything that's going on. You can still do that through Zoom, and it's the church. Is the Church of the Redeemer? They're the host, so it's on their site. If you go to their, is it the website or their Facebook site? Not sure, but you can try both. I think that's right. That's what we're going to end up doing. I think Facebook would be my first shot. Um, okay. And you know, when you quote from somewhere, if you ever give uh, a message. We make sure that you give credit to where to whatever credit's due. Like even if you're not quoting things, you still want to give credit where different ideas have come from, right? Mm -hmm. And and also for the sake of if people want more information on certain aspects of what you talked about, then this information these these sources will help them, right? And there are other sources that I could give you to help you in this, but these are ones that that I took. Or, or got information more uh, more directly, I suppose. The Defender Study Bible. The Genesis record book, it's like this thick, a study just on Genesis, right? From a scientific perspective. Um, the IVP Bible background commentary, for which it's, it gives you great contextual information. I'm giving you these also. Some of these are good for almost any study. When, when I talk about context matters, and, and I talk about grammatical and literary, you've got to, you know, you can get a sense of that uh, from learning Hebrew. Uh, literary, you can get a sense of it from studying literature and getting a grasp of how figurative language works, for example, if it's in play, you know, or, or what type of genre is it? Uh, the songs are songs, right? They're poetic. So it matters. It matters to help you understand what you're reading. But when I start talking about cultural historical context also mattering, 
And these books, the IVP by the background, I'm not with any other books, but these are great sources to help you understand what's happening, happening contextually. Uh, were there different groups who had very similar practices in the area? Were, were they talking, if they're condemning something, for example, in scripture, what are they talking about? Why, why no tattoos? It would have a, if you look at the IVP, it might have like a few paragraphs there about why no tattoos. Different groups, right, from the other week, who in their worship of false gods incorporated tattoos. You with me? When you see strange names in the Bible and don't know what they mean and what's being referred to, these books would be great to help, okay? And a lot of other great sources, but they, this one is not the source, the one for the, they call Old Testament, it's Tanakh, like this did. One for the Greek Panishah is like this did. So there's a lot of great contextual, it's just contextual information. Which will tell you things like when you're reading the book of Esther, right? Uh, that when you hear uh, about how Haman was going to die. I'll try that again. When you hear how Haman was going to die, some of you picture like when you're playing hangman with your children or something, you're drawing this little thing with a noose on it or something. No! That's not how they kill people in Babylon. No. When they hung him, there's a plat yes, there's a platform, a big wooden platform, which would contain these spikes, these wooden spikes. When they hung people in, in Babylon and later in Persia, the way of death was very much like you might have heard for, from uh, the real life Dracula, whatever his name, real name was. They impaled to by the impaler. They impaled people. On spikes. This is what they did to Haman's sons. <laughs> and, and to Haman. <laughs> and you can find that sort of information here. You can verify it in different places as well, by the way. You can even Google, you know, uh, method of torture uh, in Persia. You'll find this and you can find imagery uh, from archaeology, even, showing what they did. You know, uh, it will be a picture, they didn't have photos then, so, <laughs> but still, uh, this was the Jewish study Bible, I'm not saying they're the Messianic Jewish study Bible, by the way, there is a Jewish study Bible from the rabbinic world that has a lot of great insight, taken with a grain of salt, right, not the, it's not the same belief system, but there's a lot of great contextual information for you. And the Midrash and the Talmud are there, the references are used, as, as, as well as www.safaria.org. There you will find a great number of rabbinic sources, rabbinic writings from the Jewish world that you can you know, access very easily, the Talmud for yourself, uh, the Mishnah for yourself, for free, in, in Hebrew and interpreted. So, in case you're wondering and worried about, I don't know anything for me, I don't know Hebrew. You can see it interpreted and with commentary as well. Alright? So, if, this, if that stuff interests you, those are great sources. And, and that's another reason I stopped early because it's important for me, at, this is what a, part of what I'm called to do. Not just to teach you about a passage here and then a passage there. You teach a man, to, you know, you, you give a man a fish, he can eat for a day. Something happens to me, what happens to you? If I teach you how to fish, where do you get the information and context? If I teach you Hebrew, if I teach you about figures of speech and different genres and these sort of things, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can do your own fishing, right? <laughs> Hopefully you're very careful. You have to be very careful with these things. But you have the, I'm feeding you the data, giving you the information. Does this make sense to you? Right. Commit the knowledge to those who will, who will take it and share it with the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation, and teach them to do it right. That's what we're called to do. 
Fifty-two minutes. I knew it could be done. We're still alive. All right. Uh, we'll do the last thing, and then we can put it up. If uh, any of you are family or something, or considering yourselves family, you can always, you know, gather together. Uh, we used to always lock hands all across the room, but with COVID, we don't do that now. <laughs> but if you're family, you know, and you're comfortable with it, you know, feel free. Or if you're just really good friends and you're very, and you're both comfortable with it, please don't, you know, don't try to force that on anyone near you. That's not a good thing these days. Well, of course, it's never a good thing, but particularly these days. All right. the way, the giver of light, giver of the way, the Torah, which is light, giver of your own son, who is light, who shows us the way in this dark world so we can find our way through, who guides us through the wilderness, on the ancient paths, on the highway of holiness. Blessed are you, Adonai. Oh God, giver of light. Yevare Adonai, Bogishmarecha. Yevare Adonai, Hanavilecha, Gipurecha. Yisadonai, Hanavilecha. Adonai bless you and keep you, guard you, protect you. May Adonai make his face to shine on you, giving you favor, and be gracious to you, giving you his mercy, his undeserved mercy, his unearned mercy. Adonai, lift up his countenance upon you, not turn away from you in your need, but turn towards you, to be over you and around you, protecting you, and give you his perfect holistic peace, his shalom, every area of your life. Hashem Yeshua, in the name and the authority of the Son of God, our Elohim, Amen.